Okay, is that all right? Yep. You see that okay? Okay. That looks fine, so, yeah. Thank you, Arlene, and thank you, Deborah, for arranging tonight and um, for doing such a great job and organizing all of this. Um, I'm very uh, privileged to be able to talk uh, for the Kilgu Ballina Local History Society. And it's about Matt McGrath, of course, a, a character who I feel like I've got to know uh, over the last few months um, in terms of my own uh, amateur historical research and, uh, and reading. So I'm just going to move to the next slide. So, so just in terms of a little bit of background, um, last year I had picked up a running injury during the first lockdown. So um, I I ended up having to cycle more than run for most of the year. And as a result, this led to a kind of a wider exercise landscape than my usual um, frantic running routes between Balna and Kildu across the bridge and back. So, um, and, and as a result of that, I was, um, I, I became um, aware of different parts of the country that I, that I hadn't known before, including um, Curric Moor, which isn't actually too far from Balana, it's only five or six kilometers. But uh, I was told by uh, a friend and fellow sports enthusiast, Sean Whalon, about this heroic character who had come from Curric Moor and won Olympic medals. And uh, believe it or not, I'd never heard of him until uh, last year. So I did some research with Sean and got some uh, directions and guidance from uh, John Sage and David O'Burns in Moor Boher and um, headed out uh, late last autumn uh, on my bike to find the homestead of this heroic uh, athlete called Matt McGrath. So this is the usual frantic running routes I have around Balana and Killaloo, but thankfully on the bike, I'm now getting to see a bit more of the countryside. And hence, <clears throat> I was able to find this house, which is the old homestead of Matt McGrath in the townland of Carrick Moor in Boher, in the parish of Balna and Boher. And David Maher, who I think is on the Zoom call tonight, went up with me as well, and we went up on our bikes uh, one Saturday late last year to have a look around and uh, just to just take in the scene. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful setting, uh, looking out uh, towards Keeper Hill and um, Mother Mountain. And uh, it's a beautiful, peaceful uh, setting where, where the old McGrath homestead was. Just down the road from Matt's home is uh, um, the old parish hall, the old national school in Boer, which is now the parish hall. And Matt went to school here in the late 1800s. So just to begin with a little background on Matt, he was born in the town of Kirk Moore in this parish in 1875 or possibly 1876. There's some uh, disparity on that. He emigrated to the United States in his 20s, um, in the late 1890s. And the 1901 census shows that his father, Timothy, was then aged 49 and his mother, Anne, was aged uh, 46. Um, and there remained five younger uh, children still at home. As far as I know, there were either 10 or 11 children in the McGrath family, and uh, Matt was the eldest. So Matt arrived in America with very little to his name. Um, from what sources I've read, he had uh, just a few pence in his pocket, and he was uh, absolutely awestruck uh, by the, um, the, the, the scene. Um, apparently he was afraid that um, uh, the skyscrapers might fall on him at one stage. Um, but he, after he, he settled in, he worked hard and like many um, Irish of the time, he joined up with the New York Police Department and he subsequently reached the rank of police inspector, the, the third highest rank in the NYPD. And during the course of an exemplary career as a policeman, he was awarded the Medal of Valor on two occasions. Uh, one uh, was when he had took down a, a dangerous criminal who was, uh, uh, had a gun and Matt had to uh, challenge him. And the other occasion was when he rescued 
um, uh, a man who had tried to uh, drown himself in the Hudson River. So this is an image of um, Matt, the uh, policeman. And then Matt was also, of course, familiar with the sport of hammer throwing uh, before he left for America. And he may have been uh, quite accomplished in the skills uh, before he got there. Um, it may well be that he um, picked up a lot of his skills from following uh, John Flanagan, who was uh, a forerunner of maths in the uh, sport of um, hammer throwing. Um, so it was likely this interest in hammer throwing that drove Matt to join up with the Irish American Athletic Club. Um, and subsequently he became an honorary member of the New York Athletic Club. But the Irish American Athletic Club was the club um, that most Irish immigrants would have joined when they arrived in America. So he was a relatively late starter in competition in the United States, uh, would have been his late uh, 20s. Um, um, sorry, Arlene, is there someone there to mute? Arlene, can I just check? Sorry, uh, I was on mute myself. Yeah. So, yeah, there's. Could you, could you, to... Yes. Sorry, no. Just one second. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, Henry, I think I've everyone done now. Is that, is that okay, thank you. I think so, yeah, it looks like it. Okay, thank you, Arlene. So, so Matt was a relatively late starter in competition, and um, he would have been in his mid to late twenties before he first um, made his name known on the scene. Um, but he started to win competitions all over New York State and further afield in the United States. So there would have been various state and interstate competitions, and then different sports days run by uh, local Irish American organizations such as. The, the Tipperary Men's Association and the Galway Men's Association. So he started to win uh, all around him and he started to challenge people like John Flanagan and then later people such as uh, Patrick Ryan who came after him. Um, and just to give a little background in terms of the hammer throw itself, um, it's one of four Olympic uh, track and field throwing events. So there's the shot put, the javelin, the discus and then the hammer throw. And the hammer itself is not a hammer, it's a misnomer. It's actually a metal ball attached by a steel wire, which is just about three feet, 11 inches long, uh, with a grip at the end. And um, Matt was also very accomplished um, in throwing a 56 pound weight. The, the, generally the, the hammer throw weight is about 16 pounds, whereas the, the, the 56 pound weight is much heavier and tends to be thrown uh, with two hands at the same time. But Matt was accomplished in, in both. And um, in fact, he wrote, an, he had an entry in Spalding's Athletic Library, which is a very, very detailed description of how best to master throwing the uh, 56 pound weight. So this is an image of Matt, uh, the athlete, to go with Matt, the policeman. So as you can see for his as soon as he arrived in America, he was very busy on, on both fronts, both as an athlete and, and as a policeman. And here he is combining his two passions uh, in uniform with uh, multiple uh, awards and medals. But the national success wasn't enough for Matt, the big man from Kirk Moore, and he went on to make his mark on the international stage in hammer throwing by representing the United States in the hammer competitions at the Olympic Games of 1908, 1912. Uh, 1916 was obviously interrupted by war, 1920 and 1924. So he won gold and two silvers, and he set world records uh, for the hammer throw in 1907 and 1911. Again, I think Arlene, there's someone there just to... Sorry, no. Yeah.
Okay, perfect. And can can you take their video off as well? Yes, that's fine. Perfect. So, but of course, in these Olympic Games, Matt was representing the United States. Pre-independence Ireland didn't have its own Olympic team uh, until the 1924 uh, Olympics. Just another person there. Yeah, sorry, I just try and get muted. Sorry about this thing. Yeah, I think he's just yes. perfect. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, okay. So, so just to move on then to the international stage and the Olympics uh, in which Matt uh, participated. The first one was 1908 um, in London, so it was somewhat of a homecoming. He was coming back to this part of the world um, after. Uh, about a decade in the United States. Um, so you can imagine it, it would have been a big undertaking at that stage to travel across the Atlantic by ship. Um, and there must have been huge excitement and um, um, that went into the trip. The, in that particular um, Olympics, the marathon was actually won by Johnny Hayes, whose parents had come from Nina. And uh, Matt McGrath went on and won silver in the hammer throwing competition. And both Matt and Johnny Hayes have been immortalized together in a statue in Nina, which some of you may be familiar with, um, along with the 1932 Olympic um, uh, 400 meter uh, uh, hurdler, Bob Tisdall, who also uh, was from Tipperary. So again, this is a statue you may, you may well be familiar with from Nina outside the courthouse. We have Matt on the left throwing the hammer, um, Johnny Hayes in the middle, um, the marathon, the marathon runner, and then um, uh, Tisdale on the right, the hurdler. And 1908 was um, somewhat of a controversial Olympics because, um, as as still happens in modern times, sport uh, was is often politicised. And at that time in 1908, um, the United Kingdom and the British Empire was still very much in the ascendancy. Uh, but the United States was starting to assert itself as a new world power. So this played out um, in the Olympics of 1908. Um, there's various legends about the actual games itself, one of which is that the, the, British, the British hosts of the Olympics uh, didn't fly an American flag in the Olympic Stadium. Um, um, and this may have been uh, just their way of, of having a little dig at the, the American visitors. But in terms of the actual parade for the Olympic, um, the opening ceremony, um, there is also a legend. And that legend is that the American flag bearer, a man called Ralph Rose, who also had Irish connections, um, he did not dip the, the flag, the American flag, the stars and stripes, uh, as was the expectation for all countries as they filed past the royal uh, viewing box. And again, those various legends associated, one is that Martin Sheridan, one of the Irish, Irish American athletes, the other is that it may have been Matt McGrath himself, um, said to Ralph Rose that if you dip that flag, uh, you'll end up in the hospital tonight. So in any, whatever happened, Ralph Rose didn't dip the American flag. And it set up tension uh, and added to the tension between the British and American teams for the for the games and it also set up the tradition that the american teams um do not dip their flag uh, when they pass dignitaries or royalty uh in olympic ceremonies uh the american flag famously dips for no earthly king so it may be that matt had a role in starting that tradition and it may as well be that that tradition started not just because of the Americans trying to assert themselves as a world power, but it may also have been because of Irish Americans yeah, showing some uh, resentment uh, mm -hmm. for the British Empire and the fact that they were not allowed to compete uh, for the country of their birth. So again, is there anyone there to mute or to take out, Arlene? Just having a look through now, sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I think we have everyone now. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. okay. 
So, as I've said earlier, in the competition itself in 1908 in London, Matt won silver in the hammer throw. The gold medal winner was a man called John Flanagan from County Limerick, and he was also representing the United States. And this was John Flanagan's third consecutive Olympic gold medal. So that was a, a remarkable achievement in itself. And the bronze medal in the competition was won by Con Walsh, who was originally from County Cork, and he was representing Canada at the Games. So this was a, a remarkable achievement for, for John Flanagan, but for Irish athletes generally, when you consider that three Irish-born athletes won gold, silver and bronze in the one event. And it's a unique achievement that um, has not yet been replicated. But of course, aside from Fanagan um, and Con Walsh, there was an even wider group of Irish athletes representing the United States and Canada at the time. And they were known because of their size and their strength as the Irish whales. So along with Matt McGrath and Fanagan and Walsh, there was Simon Gillis, um, who was originally uh, from um, County Tipperary, I think, as was James Mitch Mitchell. Pat McDonald was a Clare man. Paddy Ryan was from Limerick, and I think he may have some connections with um, some of the people attending tonight, and it was Martin Sheridan from Mayo. So these men all represented primarily the United States, um, whilst represented Canada, and over 24 years um, in various Olympics, they won 23 Olympic medals, which was a huge haul of medals for, for these men. Um, and to put that in context, uh, Ireland's total Olympic medal count since uh, independence, since having an independent team, is 31. So these men nearly matched that in, in the first 24 years uh, of Olympic competition. Later on then, in 1928 and 1932, the, um, the hammer throwing competition uh, tradition continued for Irish athletes because Dr. Pat O'Callaghan uh, from County Cork uh, won gold in 1928 and 1932. And these were, 1928, his gold was the first gold for Ireland as an independent uh, nation. So this, this story about Matt was brewing in, in my mind for a number of months. I had written the blog about him late last year, or I was thinking about writing the blog about him late last year, and it was only when my sister Anna sent me on a link to Dr. Pat O'Callaghan's achievements that had prompted me to to look further into Matt's story and, and to complete the blog. So thanks to Anna for that. Um, with Pat O'Callaghan's wins in 28 and 32, it also meant that um, I think all but one of the first seven or eight Olympic hammer throwing competitions were won uh, by Irishmen. So these are the, the famous Irish whales, um, mighty men and, and absolute heroes in their day. These, these men would have been uh, celebrities in their day um, as much as any uh, modern sports stars and they were, were also symbolic of a whole new wave of uh, Irish people who came from uh, relative poverty and were trying to make a new life in the United States and one well there were two, two ways to to make it up the ranks uh, where w one was to join the New York Police Department and the other was to become an athlete and lots of these men combined the two, like Matt McGrath. And by representing the United States and by winning medals, um, they were able to break through a lot of uh, stigma and a lot of prejudice that Irish, uh, uh, particularly Irish Catholics, would have encountered when they arrived in America first. Um, they would have generally joined, as I said earlier, the Irish American Athletic Club, whereas the, um, the New York Athletic Club was reserved more for um, wealthier uh, middle-class uh, Americans. Um, but people like Matt, John Flanagan, Con Walsh, all, all of these men made names for themselves and really um, put forward a very positive image for uh, Irish immigrants. This is a photograph that I got from Sean and Waylon. Thank you, Sean. Uh, and it was sent to Sean from Nick and Joe Bailey. And this is, and thank you to, to Nick and Joe as well, this features Matt along with uh, Patrick Ryan and Pat McDonald. So these are, this is a, a tip man, a clear man, and a limerick man together. Um, this is Paddy Ryan, again, who represented the United States. 
He won two Olympic medals himself, and he was originally from County Limerick. And this is a cigarette card, which was um, one of those things, a little bit like the match attacks that our, our kids collect nowadays. But the Mecca cigarette cards were with uh, features athletes from various backgrounds, baseball players, football players, and athletes such as Matt. So as you can see, um, that's his own, own particular card. So moving on from 1908 then in his first um, Olympics, um, McGrath, Matt went one better in 1912 in Stockholm. Uh, he won gold. Um, he obliterated the field. As far as I know, he, for all of his five throws, he was about 13 feet uh, ahead of, of his, his competitors. And he set an Olympic record in 1912 that wasn't broken for 24 years until the, the Munich Olympics of 1936, the ill-fated uh, Munich Olympics. Then, of course, 1916, we had war and there was no Olympics. Um, so we skip on to 1920. And this was the Antwerp Olympics. And Matt, unfortunately, uh, in his first one or two throws, uh, injured his knee and was unable to complete, uh, to finish his, his throws. But his initial one or two throws were long enough to guarantee him a fifth place finish in that Olympics. And then to add to all of that, he came back in 1924, at which time he would have been um, 47, 48. And he, this was the Paris Olympics and he won silver there, uh, becoming the oldest ever track and field Olympic medal, medalist for the United States. And that's a record that stands to this day, as far as I'm aware. And even after that, um, later into the 1920s, as Matt turned 50 and over, he continued to win competitions in the United States at master's levels um, in the hammer. And he went back to the 56 pound weight as well at different points. So this, he, he, as I say, he put forward this along with his, his colleagues in the Irish Wales, this hugely positive, um, inspiring, heroic image uh, of Irishmen abroad. Um, and a, a won countless medals uh, in the United States and, and won medals at the highest level in the Olympics. But he also kept in touch with his home parish of, of Ballina and Boher. And he um, apparently competed in the Ballina sports in 1936. This is something that was recounted by Jimmy Sage. Um, and I'll be talking a bit more about Jimmy later on in the presentation. In terms of his personal life, I haven't been able to get a huge amount, but it does seem that um, he had a good deal of sadness. He was married to Loretta Smith and they had one daughter, Elvira, and she sadly died at the age of 22. After her death later, Matt and Loretta subsequently adopted a boy uh, called Bobby Lowe. And then in 1941, Matt passed away. He had been struggling with liver cancer for some time and he developed pneumonia in January 41 and died. And he's buried in Calvary Cemetery in Queens, New York. So Matt's memory is brought to life uh, very vividly in the words of another great local athlete from Boher, from very close to Matt's home. And this is Ginny Sage. Um, Jimmy was a leading cross-country runner of his day in the 1940s and 1950s, as far as I know. And he would go on uh, in later years to establish St. Louis Athletic Club in Ballina Boger with uh, Father Dick Kelly and, and others. It was with St. Louis that I had my first experience of cross-country running, and I can still remember the enthusiasm of Jimmy Sage and others. Uh, St. Louis gradually faded and went out of existence but as you know, athletes from Ballina and Killaloo and surrounding areas now have the new Derg Athletic Club founded in 2013 and with the wonderful training base at Carisford that is uh, under ongoing development at the moment. And in a nice link between St. Louis Athletic Club from the 1980s and 1990s, and those Irish Olympic titans of the first decades of the 20th century, particularly Matt McGrath. Jimmy Sage was recorded on local radio here in Ballinacillu in 1987, recording his memories of Matt McGrath. So this is 
a fascinating interview because it's it's a living link between uh, Jimmy uh, Sage and uh, the great Matt McGrath. So that interview uh, with Jimmy was faithfully transcribed by Kevin uh, M and Kevin A. Griffin in their lovely history of Balanan Bohr Parish. This is the cover of that book. I'm sure lots of you have it at home. And then this is a transcript of, of Jimmy Sage's recollections of Matt McGrath. He was a massive big man. I saw him in our school in Bohar in 1936. He did not look his height. Because he was so broad, he did not look the immense man he was. But it was a wonderful thing for a man to come from such a small place up in the Ara Mountains to win an Olympic medal. A wonderful achievement. During that period, there were a few good weights people in Ballina Parish. This is still Jimmy Sage's um, recollection. I remember stories being told at that time that there were people in the parish almost able to beat Matt McGrath in the 56 pound and the hammer. Nick Egan of Crana was supposed to have been very close to Matt McGrath in the 56 pound. I doubt very much if he would have been able to get close to him with the hammer. There was one thing I noticed. He had instructed all the young people while he was at home. They were able to throw the hammer perfectly. I saw three neighbours of his throwing the hammer at different times and they all had perfect timing, perfect hammer throwing movement. He had instructed all of them to throw it and they were all lighter and smaller than him. I remember reading an account in the Nina Garden that he set a world record in the hammer in the showgrounds in Nina. There was an attendance of approximately 30,000 people in Nina that day. It was a Tuesday. The shops in the town were closed and people came from all over Ireland. In fact, there were four Olympic champions competing in Nina that day. So I think that's a lovely connection and there's a lot more um, from Jimmy Sage um, on uh, his recollections of Matt McGrath and Jimmy would have had very precise details on the, the science behind hammer throwing and weight throwing um, and the particular skills involved. Um, and it was also nice for me to have the link with Jimmy because of course his son, John, was the one who gave me uh, initial directions to find uh, Matt McGrath's old homestead in Corrigmore. So just to finally kind of wind up, uh, Matt McGrath from literally this parish, he was a true hero in his sport and in his profession. He left as a young man, his small place up in the Ara Mountains, as, as Jimmy said, for New York, and he made his mark in the New York Police Department and, of course, in Olympic history. In fact, such was Matt McGrath's real-life heroism that he outshone another fictional Matt, the heroic Matt the Thrasher of Charles J. Kickham's 1879 novel, Nak Nagao, or The Homes of Tipperary, which is a, a famous novel of its time published only a few years after Matt McGrath uh, was born himself. This is a cover of Matt McGrath. And in, in one of the histories of Matt McGrath, I read, um, it said that Matt himself used to read Matt McGrath and was inspired by Matt Donovan or Matt the Thrasher. Um, whether that's true or not, it's, it's hard to know. But in Kickham's novel, in Matt McGrath, uh, one of the most iconic scenes involves a high stakes weight throwing competition that was held on a rural sports day. It's a very tense scene um, on a hot summer's day. Um, they send for um, what they called a sledge from the blacksmiths, which were, they were going to throw in the field. And the protagonists in the competition are Matt the tra Thrasher, spelt with one T, Matt. And he was effectively symbolic in representing the poor Irish tenant farmers. And he was taking on Captain French, son of a rich landlord and thus representing the landed gentry. And Matt uh, defeats his wealthy opponent with a mighty throw of the sledge. And his victory is, uh, like the many real victories of our own Matt McGrath, inspired and for the credit of the little village. And finally, this is another nice quote, which I just came across in recent days from George Curry, who was a US sports writer in 1927. Again, just highlighting the, the heroism 
of, of people like Matt. He wrote, in all the history of sport, we have never had a man like Matt. He is nearly too legendary to be true. So I'm just going to wind up and thank a few people. I'd like to thank my own family for introducing me to athletics in St. Louis uh, back in the 1980s and taking me all over Munster to uh, muddy cross-country events. Um, and I'd like to think that, as I said, there was that link between St. Louis and those Irish whales from the early 20th century through people uh, like Jimmy Sage and others. I'd like to thank Sean and Waylon, who is a friend and a fellow sports enthusiast who only last year uh, was the first person to tell me about Matt McGrath. I'd like to thank again John Sage and David O'Burns, who gave me directions to the house and gave me some more background about Matt McGrath. David Maher, my friend who uh, helped me to, to go and explore the site uh, one of those days. Uh, Joe and Nick Bailey, who sent on information regarding uh, Patrick Ryan and some of those photographs uh, via Sean Whalon. I'd like to thank all of the former members of St. Louis Athletic Club. I think in my memory, most of them actually were from the Boher side of the parish. And again, I wonder, is that, in, is that connected to the, the memory and the lingering influence of, of Matt McGrath? And finally, of course, I'd like to thank Deborah and Arlene uh, of the Local History Society for inviting me along tonight and for organizing all of this. And finally, I'm just going to leave you with an image of Matt in his heyday. And I'm going to hand you back to Arlene now because Arlene has a video as well that we're hopefully going to try and play uh, of Matt in action in 1912 in Stockholm where he was a gold medal winner. Okay, so Arlene, I'm going to stop sharing yeah. now. Perfect. I'll leave it back to you. I'm going to give this a try now. Hopefully this will work. Can you see that? Yes, perfect. Okay, I'll just play now. Sorry. Yeah. Thank very you, Arlene. Good. That worked nicely. Oh, very good. Now, thank you very much, Henry. That was really great. He was thank he was a man, wasn't he? He sure was. Yeah. Yeah.
I had a question for you. Like, why is he statue Nina? I know because they're temporary heroes, but we should really have something here for him, shouldn't we? I think we should. And I, uh, that that statue in, in Nina is is there since around 2002. And mm. I was always kind of, um, I think there's a camera issue there, is there? It's okay. We can see you. Um, I, I, see you. Okay. I, I can see other people as well who may not want to be seen. Okay. <laughs> but um, yeah, I mean, I, I was always aware of it. I was aware of this Matt McGrath um, in, in the statue. And when I looked it up, he, he was described as being from Nina. So I, for whatever reason, he just seems to have slipped over to um, yeah. uh, being uh, assumed to be from Nina, but no, he's very much um, uh, Kirk Moore Boher. Um, and, and also, even, even as you know, there's this rivalry between Balanan and Killaloo, and then within Balanan and Boher, there's always a bit of mm -hmm. healthy rivalry too. So I almost feel slightly guilty for claiming him for, for Balanan because he's really a very, very much a Boher man. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I think it, to be very specific about it, he's, he's a Boher uh, athlete. Um, oh. I, I was to told by uh, a friend of mine from Boher during the week that he was glad to see I was going to be talking about someone from the, the nicer part of the parish. Um, <laughs> so. Yeah, gosh, we'll have to see. We were talking earlier, everyone, maybe we should put a building history sign on the Boher uh, community hall about Matt, oh, at least yeah. that way. Yeah. yeah. First, and we thought maybe put it on his house but as Henry said the, the community hall is more used you know it, it'll be seen there so it would be nice sorry Frida you were going to say so something years ago didn't they do it if you were giving your name in America they gave you the nearest market town rather than putting Boher they probably put it as the nearest market town you know for where you came from okay hmm. it would be that usually it was the nearest market town because you, but they would nobody know where Bohor or Koromor was, but they'd have known where Nina was. So maybe that's how we got caught with the net with coming from Nina. You also have relations or descendants of Matt McGrath looking to watching tonight. Can you see them there? John McGrath, Tony McGrath, Ferguson. They're all descendants related yeah. to Matt McGrath. There's an interview with Jimmy Sage again from the 80s where he says that there was. Um, a nephew called Matt McGrath living in um, in Nina, actually, who was also an athlete. Mm -hmm. This would have been back in the 40s and 50s as well. Okay, we we have some questions here for me, Henry, for you, Henry, in the chat boxes. Sure. Uh, Fiona says, "Thanks a million, Henry. Fascinating." I'm wondering if you got a sense from your readings, the extent to which he, Matt, overly articulated or promoted his Irish heritage or background. I suppose if he was involved yes, in the um, dipping of the flag or the non-dipping the non of the flag. <laughs> yeah. Now that's, that could have, that could be a total myth and yeah. it could have been another Irish American athlete called Martin Sheridan as well. But to, to answer your question, I think the bottom line, in my reading of him, um, I would have said that he wouldn't have overtly promoted his Irish heritage or background. That My feeling is that he was a very quiet, uh -huh. reserved, non-political type of man. Um, he, I, I would imagine he was a man of few words and he, he let his actions speak for himself in terms of his athletic prowess and his, um, his heroism as a policeman as well. So he 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 did obviously do a lot of things that Irish Americans did, but he may may have had limited choices too. So he joined the police force and he he joined the Irish American Athletic Club and he tried his very best in those areas. But I don't think they were overt expressions of his Irishness. I think they were just maybe he, the limited options he had. Um, so that's that's my feeling on it. I, I I certainly haven't read anything where he talked about Irishness or Irish nationalism or about his heritage or, or work. Okay, but he was he was so good that he when he came home he he taught the young people how to hammer throw, which was 
was really lovely, wasn't it? So he, he did, and and from again yeah, from my yeah. from my reading of of his early days, he would have he would have um, walked for miles all over the country to see John Flanagan, who was a forerunner of his as a, as a hammer thrower, mm -hmm. and tried to pick up his technique and learn skills from him. But I think as well, among the hammer throwers, there was a certain mm -hmm. amount of, there was obviously a lot of rivalry, but also a certain amount of secrecy as to how to do it, do it right and how to perfect it. Because if you, if you had stumbled on how to, how to perfect the, the method, you were probably unlikely to share it yeah. with the rival. Um, okay. but, but Matt seemed to be happy to share it with, with the young people in this parish when he would come home anyway, again, as Jimmy had recounted. And yeah. um, I, I know I know very little. Obviously, running is my sport. But I know very little about hammer throwing. But from what I've read of it, it looks like it's 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 not just about brawn or weight or size or height. It's 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 very much a technical technique based sport. Um, and in in one of the sources I mentioned earlier, when he wrote in in uh, Spalding's Athletic Library about training for the fifty six pound weight. His account there goes on for three full three full pages about you know um, feet, feet feet placement and how many turns and how many spins and how many um, different movements to do in certain ways. So it was very very, very technical. It was actually. He, as I say, he was happy to share that knowledge. It was. Obviously, yeah. That brings us on to actually the next question any, from Owen. Any idea of where the tradition of hammer throwing came from? He says, three Irish athletes winning the three Olympic medals, not a sport I would have particularly associated with Ireland. Has it died out or where has it gone? Is it? Yes. It's, I don't know much I'm, about I, it. I'm not surprised Owen... I'm not, sorry, I'm not surprised Owen asked this because Owen is a, 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 a sports historian, an amateur sports historian like myself. He wrote a three-part blog for my sports blog last year on the origins of um, American ice hockey. Uh, he did a fascinating overview going back into the history of ball and stick games in Ireland and throughout Europe and Scandinavia. And um, he made a pretty strong argument for um, hurling uh, being a, being um, um, a, a, an earlier version of, of ice hockey, so this is this is Owen's own, I think. Um, no. But to, but to answer his question, as far as I can see, um, hammer throwing was featured in the Talton Games in in the early twentieth century, and uh, Matt McGrath himself competed in the Talton Games and won. He performed in the nineteen twenties, actually in Croke Park at one stage as well. I, on on one of his home trips, it may have been. When he was home possibly for the Antwerp uh, Olympics. Mm -hmm. um, but going back further, I think hammer throwing is featured in the Highland Games in Scotland. Um, and, but as far as I know, I, I think it may just go back three, four hundred years. So it's relatively new. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think it was fe featured with, say, in ancient Greek Olympics, as far as I'm aware. Um, which you, you, you will see if you look up Highland Games, kind of various versions of a hammer throwing. And as you know, they throw logs and all kinds of things up there. Yeah. So, um, and and, is, it, and it, is it still an Olympic sport, isn't it? Oh, oh it is, yeah, absolutely, yeah. Um, 19, as I say, Matt's record was broken in 1936 by a German in the Munich Olympics. And then we had World War II. And since the late 40s, then it's been dominated by Eastern Europeans and Russians, um, yeah. both men both men and women. Um, so, so um, it's it's yeah it's, it's still an Olympic sport. Um, it hasn't died out, but at the same time, it's it's a pity when you consider our heritage. The fact that seven, I think, of of the eight first hammer throwing Olympic games golds were won by Irish men or men who were born in Ireland. Uh -huh. It's a shame. If we have um, Bunty Kelly here, Matt's niece, living in Limerick. Or Linda, Linda Hogan is saying Bunty Kelly is on. Is she Linda? <coughs> no. Yes. She is. Yes. Yeah. She, she's there under Myra Kylie's name. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, find her and unmute. So she'll have to unmute. Hello. Yeah. Yeah, I have her here now. One second. Thanks, Charlene. Yeah. More. Can I un? Can I unmute her? Mm. 
No, I actually can't. I can only ask her to unmute. I can't unmute her. I left her there. Ma'am, if you press the microphone on the bottom left. It's got a red line, a little, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Yeah. Bunty, is Bunty there? No, I'm a... Okay. Oh, yeah. hello. How are hello. you? Hello. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, it was very nice. Um, there's a plaque erected in the old Boher School. It's actually the hall there now, in honour of Matt McGrath. Uh, it, it was um, uh, 2003, I think it was, and um, it was erected there, and it was unveiled by Sean Norton of Nina, already an athlete and uh, uh, I suppose a relative by marriage as well. And um, it was um, a wonderful night actually in the in Bohr Hall. And uh, I, like together with uh, the statues in Ina at the courthouse, which are, are um, very beautiful, very beautiful and great credit due to that committee. They worked very hard on it for a long time. And um, it was a beautiful presentation. And we had uh, American cousins home as well at the time. And it was uh, very entertaining and absolutely uh, a wonderful, wonderful experience at the front of the, of the courthouse on that day and and uh, I just wanted to add that to it now I mean he, apart from everything else in his sporting life he was a wonderful man a very generous man he was very caring and he brought that from his his homeland and um, uh, he that's how he was taught that's how he was brought up and in his own words it was beautifully written of his childhood and being reared up in Curramore. And um, uh, I have to say there were wonderful people of that era, wonderful people there were. Um, back when everything was so, uh, to our standards today, I suppose, were very primitive. But uh, he enjoyed everything so much and he trained a lot. And I suppose in, in his, his love of sporting and the hammer, he used to have, throw a stone. It was just mm -hmm. a stone he had and he, he threw it from the shoulder. And as well as uh, competing in all the local little sports and hurling and football and everything else at that time. And um, as well as um, for the entertainment, it should be through the hills and veils of that time, and um, hunting hares and and rabbits and all that kind of thing. And it gave him his exercise and he would walk miles. He often walked 20 or 25 miles in a day. Mm -hmm. And often uh, to compete in those sports locally, he walked to those places, which would be, you know, maybe seven, 10 miles or more, or 12 miles sometimes, or even more. And, you know, he got a lot of exercise through that. But not only that, but when he went, when he went to America, then he, he, um, he trained and he had to get employment at the time to suit his times for training mm -hmm. and, and that. But um, he, he felt, I think, that it was back at the foot of the Arrow Mountains that he got his real training and his real strength from, you know, that, that was really, I think, in his own words, you know. So um, thank you for that and thank you for your presentation. Thank you, Bundy. That was very, very nice to hear. Have you spoken before, Henry, yourself and Bunty? Have you met? No, no, no. we haven't. No. It's lovely, lovely no. to meet you, Bunty. Yeah. No, no, and I, I don't, I never, no. So, so there is a plaque in Boher Hall then, Bunty, yeah? Yeah, so that's it. Yeah, it is. Inside, is it? Or it so inside in, uh, inside in, in the building. And um, they gave a beautiful night out uh, that committee and a lovely night. Uh, in fact, I have a video of it. And um, 
it was um, it, it was a wonderful gesture from that committee mm. to, to erect that hidden, you know. Yeah. And uh, it was so, very much appreciated as well. Maybe we could put one on the outside, a, a, build a, a little plaque for him, so that people walking by could read about him also. It would be nice, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah, it would be, it would be nice. It would be nice. Yeah. yeah. And, and that, no, you know. He definitely deserves to be remembered yeah. anyway, all those yeah. medals. Yeah. 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 And he, he went to school in in Bohor, of course. Yes. Uh, the Serenity was teaching him. And then he went to secondary school in Killinoo. Okay. Oh. Yeah. At that time. Edmonds is. So that's. Maybe? What are you doing? Uh, way back then. So that's. Um, uh, that would be his kind of. Um, Background. I suppose a um, connection with yes. Anna Kilinu. Do you know what happened to his adopted son, Monty? The son he adopted? Uh, well, he emigrated. He went to uh, some other country. Okay. And 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 was his wife American? What was her name? She had a lovely name. Loretta. What was it? Loretta. Laura. Laura. Yeah. Yeah. Loretta. She was American, was she? Uh, Irish American. Irish American, okay. Irish American. Yeah, it's lovely. It's lovely to yeah to someone that it was related. lovely. Like oh. yeah, I was in the cemetery. Like I was in at his grave. Okay. And that and I, you know, and and. Bunty, did you ever meet him? Sorry, no, I'm not doing the maths right, am I? No, no, I didn't meet him, but my brother met him. Six, sorry. Oh. Yeah. yeah, my brother met him. Oh, wow. Um, yes. which, which was also Matt McGrath. Oh, okay. But, yeah. But do you know what happened to his medals? Well... Melon's asking here. We didn't get them because in, uh, his wife got ill and we don't know what happened to the, med the oh, no. medals. Mm. Okay. And you to be your uncle? My uncle, yeah. my father's brother. Oh, wow, it's mm. amazing. We're doing a tray thing here as well, huh? Henry, yeah. we might put you and Bunty in touch afterwards for a, a chat if you'd like that. Yeah. Sorry? I, I didn't realize we had such a close connection uh, with Matt. Yeah. I'd love to have so a chat. Now, with you. Where, where do you live, so Bunty? Stage. In Limerick? Bunty's in Limerick, I think. Pardon. Yeah, I am. I am. I am. But I was born in Cormor as well. In oh. that house? Yes. Oh, oh. wow. <laughs> so, I mean, cool. I could tell you a lot more tips. <laughs> Bunty, who owns the house now? Is it the house? Oh, well, still that, that was sold a few times. Oh, and right. it, it hasn't been lived in. For quite a long time now. No. And oh. she's she's gone out of the family, like you know. Oh, that's a pity. So oh, um, nice. oh, are you related to John McGrath then above? John McGrath that lived in Corrimore as well. Was he a cousin? John McGrath? Yeah. He was uh, there's no John McGrath in Corrimore. At the minute. But there's McGrath in Corrimore now, isn't there? There is. Um, um, there was Paddy McGrath. Yeah, Paddy, and yeah. John and Joseph. Yeah, and he's they their was, father. They were second cousins of mine. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Their father, John. They, they were second cousins, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because yeah. some of them watching tonight as well, Tony McGrath and all of them are on it. They're yeah, well, I, I, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, that's wonderful, Bunchy. It's lovely to oh, meet you. Well, did, nice to meet you too. Yeah. I think we'll oh, definitely yeah. have to, through Linda, I think we'll definitely have to meet up with you. When oh. all the restrictions and everything stop. There's a there's a treason store for you. <laughs> <laughs> we look forward to that tree. Uh, yeah, I would be looking forward to that. <laughs> it would be lovely to meet you and talk. Yeah. Now, well, thank you. Very thank good. You. Yeah. Right. Would anyone else like to ask a question? Yeah. You're Everyone's muted. Um, has anyone else? You can unmute yourself if you like and ask a question. If anyone is, everyone's muted. Yeah. Oh, no. 
It's our last chance now before we say goodbye. What time is it? 8.35. No one else? Oh. No. That seems oh. fantastic. It was. It was really lovely, Henry. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We're delighted we found you. We found Henry on Twitter. We didn't even know he was in Ballina. It's terrible. <laughs> so, yeah. We have our next talk in May. Mm -hmm. uh, the 18th, is it, Arlene? The 19th of May, yeah. 19th, 19th of May on John Charlesworth, a young English soldier that is buried in St. Flannan's Cathedral. And Dara O'Connell is going to give that talk. So, Henry, that's it. We'll have to say thank you very much for all the thank work you, you put into the presentation. And, Henry, how did you find the video? Was it on YouTube all the time, the Olympics? It was, it was, yeah, you had to kind of, it's, it's, I think it's a two hour video, isn't it? Um, yeah. You just yeah. scroll, scroll through to find the actual few yeah. seconds of that, yeah. Very he clear. Was, yeah, isn't it, Frida? And it really mm. illustrates what a big lump of a fella he was, like, yeah. doesn't it? Yes. Really. He's just huge. Yeah. The photos mm. are one thing, but to see him moving, yeah. Yes. So maybe we'll all go away and decide to take up hammer throwing now. <laughs> just took that hard, really. <laughs> Sorry, if you Sorry, Deborah. There's just two more lovely comments in the chat. Oh, sorry, Arlene. Yep. I just saw them coming up there. Sorry. Okay. Thanks so much, Henry. That was lovely. Bunty and Mam haven't sat in the kitchen for over a year, only doors away from each other, and and a great neighbor. So it was a great get together, girl. Yeah. Now that you're vaccinated. So, I, Katrina Gleason says, wouldn't it be a project to try and find the medals? That's very true. Like, where are yeah. they? Yeah. Wow. yeah. Very good question. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder where they are. Do you think someone sold them for the gold value or would that happen? Could happen. Could happen. Mm. Gosh. Yeah. There's your next project, Henry, now. <laughs> oh, find the medals. <laughs> find the medals. <laughs> yeah. It's an awful yeah. shame, isn't it? To think it would be gone. Yeah. 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 Um, Goretti says thank you. Susanna says thank you for a lovely presentation. Dr. Fergal Madden says super lecture and thank you. Mm -hmm. So, and thank you from us, Henry. And so we we'll look forward you. to your next yeah. bit of research. Th thank you, Deborah and Arlene, and, and not just for tonight, but for all the great work you do with the Local History yeah. Society. It's uh, such thank an active you. and uh, really yeah. wonderful initiative. So thanks for all the work you do. And particularly the signs, they're really, Brought a whole new life to to Killaloo and Ballina for me. Anyway, I I love reading them. We've more coming. We've three more coming, Arlene, don't we? Three more waterways history ones, which are really well, interesting. History. Yeah, and we're hoping mm -hmm. for another twenty more of the building history signs in the coming weeks or months. We just wait, Tw wait twenty. Wow. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. <laughs> we never stop. <laughs> yeah. No. no. So, oh, sorry. That's my landline. So okay. okay, thanks so, so much. Th everyone. Th thanks everyone. Thank you, Bunty, as well. Bye. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.